Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to another one of my interviews and podcasts. And with me today is Stephen Wagaspak of Lobby. Stephen, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Man, I really appreciate your time me today. Too. I'm fired up to, to visit with you. I'm glad we made it work. Well, I, I'm glad you're fired up because I tell you what, I think that Lobby is something that will fire our communities up. Yeah. It's something I've had my eye on a long time. This is kind of an introduction for them, but, but a segue for you, you know, is that I don't think the people of Louisiana realize, you know, the, the, the organizations that work for not only business, yeah. but people. And I've been doing a lot of interviews lately on those organizations with businesses and people that work for the people at the state capitol yep. and when they're not when they don't know about it. That's right. And I think that Lobby does that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, before we talk about Lobby, sure. I want to talk about you, where mm -hmm. you were before Lobby, and yeah. you know, in your experience. I think that's important for people to know when we talk about Lobby. Yeah. So a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in Louisiana in Gonzales, uh, Louisiana. Uh, so just you know, just south of here. Um, when I was a kid, we ended up moving to Missouri because in the mid '80s the the economy was tough. Um, that was during the you know the really tough times here, and so we moved away, came back for LSU, and then went to D.C. for about 10 years. And in D.C., I worked on the Hill. I got involved with government and politics and policy and all that stuff, and went to law school up there. But in 2007, I, I knew a guy named Bobby Jindal who was in Congress. I didn't work for him; I knew him. And it was kind of one of these flipping conversations. I was talking to him one day. I said, hey, look, I understand you might be running for governor one day. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of the state. I'm a big fan of you. You know what I can do. He's like, seriously? And so the next day he called me. He's like, come meet with me. He's like, hey, listen, you said you wanted to help. Why don't you come work for me, blah, blah, blah. And literally in the span of about an hour conversation, decided to leave D.C. We've been there for 10 years. We're about to have our third child and move home for that 07 election. And so I was this policy guy on that campaign. And so I wrote all this policy papers that no one read and all that yeah. stuff. And so I did all that. And then literally from election night through that first term, I served a couple different roles. I was deputy chief of staff, executive counsel. Um, and then towards the end of that first term, I was chief of staff. Um, and then, you know, got to learn a lot and do a lot of special uh, impactful things. And then in the reelect in the second term, I was there for a little bit, but then I um, I stepped down about six eight months into that first that second term, and decided to uh, to, to go off into uh, other opportunities, which led me to here. But there's a lot of background there that's important to me on what drives mm -hmm. me. Growing up here, I'm a Louisiana guy through right. and through, but being forced to leave at a young age mm -hmm. really taught me the importance of having a strong economy where families can stay. Right. Because our family didn't stay. Exactly. And that experience still drives some of my hunger and 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 drive to make sure that our economy is as strong as possible. So no matter who you are or where you live in Louisiana, you can stay right here, raise your family, right. start a business. You don't have to leave to do that. And so that's a big piece of what makes me interested in some of these policy issues. I love that, you, I love that you're bringing that vision of keeping people in Louisiana. That's the, that's the game. Oh, yeah. That's the game. I, 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 it's something that a lot of people say. You know, oh, I want to keep people home. You know, the politicians like to say, keep people home. But, you know, until you really start dissecting what Louisiana is all about and the business and industry part of it, you know, you don't really understand the meaning of keeping people at home. When you look at our, 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 our culture, our economy, it really is designed to have people who grew up here stay here. That's right. You know, and our families, I think, are, 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 are stronger when we keep them here. I mean, it's all great, well, and good to say, oh, I want my youngin to go, uh, you know, to go to another state and learn something different. But we lose not only our culture, but we lose our economy when, when people leave. And we strengthen it when people stay here and then tour and get the experience, but, you know, come back. And, and, you know, traditionally, we, we all know this in Louisiana. If you look at those lists of, like, native-born citizens, we lead this country right. year in, year out of people who were born here, stay here. We have a lot of native-born citizens here. I will tell you that's a good and a bad thing. And, and the bad thing is is that for years we rested our laurels on that. And we avoided policy decisions we had to make. We tolerated shady politics. We let we didn't mind all that stuff because our faith and our culture and our family was so strong. We were going to stay no matter what. Right. In today's era, it's a different world. It's the gig economy. Workers can live wherever they want. Exactly. Companies can. You could be a company in Europe and have all your customers here in in Louisiana and be just fine. So the world has made us have to rethink our approach to keeping people here. And we can't just depend on food, faith, and culture. We've got to add with it good tax code, right. a good education system, good infrastructure. We have to add the other pieces that for so long we avoided the tough conversations. And 
I feel like that's our role to kind of force people to have some of those uncomfortable conversations, strive for complicated but effective solutions, and add that on top of the food, faith, and culture because we need more to compete in today's economy. I, I, I like how you added on that. Like the, like the building block food, faith, and culture, you know, is, is a good foundation for family, you know, but when you add the good things on top of all that, you not only, you know, of course, magnify yeah, the food, faith, and culture. Yeah, it's not just family. a luxury, it's a mandate. I mean, we all have friends and family or colleagues who their kids are leaving. And you wonder why. Well, because the, the market and the world they're growing up in is different than the one we grew up in. It is easy to leave, have a strong economy, get home easily, get in, stay in touch with your food, faith, right. and culture through social media. You don't have to live here to enjoy here anymore. And so we've got to be better as a state and an economy to keep our sons and daughters here because if we, if we fail to do that, and keep with the same old, same old of like, yeah, we'll avoid the tough decisions. We'll just have a good time. We're going to wake up 15, 20 years from now, and our our youth have gone. Well, we're waking up today from 15, 20 years ago You're right. and finding out mistakes that we made, Amen. which brings us to lobby. You know, how did lobby? I'm glad you said that, yeah. too. I'm, I'm, I, it brings us to lobby. Who started Lobby? How did it get started? And yeah. and and, it, and the mission of Lobby. It's a great it's a, it's a great example. So, um, in the mid '70s, uh, challenging times in Louisiana, um, you had big um, you had Evan Evers was the governor. You had big labor and big business that were fighting nonstop in the capital, also in, in the hinterlands. That's when coming out of the McKithen era, there was this growth of the manufacturing sector all along the Mississippi River, especially. And there's a lot of uh, animosity between the labor unions and business, and there were car bombings and all that stuff. And a, a trend at the time around the country was certain states were becoming right to work states. We're passing a law which basically said, hey, look, we're not going to micromanage the employer employee relationship. We're going to let the free market take place in there. And so there's a group of business people that said, you know what, we should start an organization in the mid 70s to pass right to work in Louisiana. Lobby was formed. So Lobby has been here since the 70s? Yes, to okay. pass right to work. And so we were formed in 73. By 75, right to work was passed. And it was a very bloody battle in the Capitol. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. It was nasty. But it passed. So at that point, was that in when time, the explosion in the in the uh, in the Senate happened? It was around that time. Yeah, stuck it, in, it wasn't it's, because of that issue, yeah. but it was around that time. <laughs> yeah. But look, I, I'll, I'll give you one example. One of the members that Lobby had hired, an attor- a bright attorney, um, to come down and help with that. The the night of the bill passage, he was actually shot and killed um, in Baton Rouge. So it was, it was very tough times during that era. But having said that. They passed right. Yeah, it was a legislator that was killed. You no, said? it was the outside attorney that was hired to help with this. Yeah. Wow. Still undetermined on what, what cause of that was, and everyone has their own theory. That's probably a different podcast, right? Yeah. <laughs> but at that time, the organization said, "Okay, we passed right to work, but let's stick around and try to drive Louisiana's economy forward." So since then, we try to promote and defend free enterprise. And every year, we gather business people all around the state, and we say, "What make it easier for you to grow your business here? Is it tax? Is it education? Is it something else?" And we help them on policy. We help them on elections and candidates. We help them in a myriad of ways to try to make it easier to run a business here. And um, that's what we've been doing since the '70s. So, their first director was a guy named Ed Steimel, who was a very innovative, well-known leader of the time. Mm-hmm. He was kind of the hard-charging reformer of the '70s, and he came over from Par to lead Lobby. And he was there for about 12, 13 years. Um, and then Dan Juno replaced him, and then I replaced Dan nine years ago. So our core DNA goes back to those 70s. Do you still talk to those guys from the early years? Well, Ed has passed. Right. Um, but Dan Juno and I, yeah, in our place, we do talk from time to time. And he was a very gracious and welcoming person. When I came into this, he was great with working with me on that transition. But um, both of those guys were uh, innovative leaders during their time in Louisiana. And so I'm proud to be a part of the organization and follow their footsteps. That's interesting. So, so basically, the, the core of Lobby, you know, is almost generational. It's almost kind of like yes. you see. There's you've talked three CEOs exactly. in the almost 50 years of existence. Yeah. But what I liked hearing is that you're not just fighting for business and industry. You actually talked about being like a liaison to find out, you know, between free enterprise, business industry, and the workers and the, and the, and the and, you know, people that are employed, that you're kind of an intermediary between them. If that's right. That's right. And look, and we are all shapes and sizes. There are a lot of trade associations in the building. You're aware of that. And, you know, most of them are unique to one group. There's an oil and gas one. There's a chemical one. There's a trucking one, whatever. And those are all great partners of ours. What's interesting about us is we're, we're all of it. And so when we have a board meeting, we're in our board uh, room right now. Okay, yeah. Um, when we have a board meeting, you have a hundred business leaders from around the state in these meetings. They come from every different sector, every different pocket of the state. They all have very strong different opinions. Yeah. We have some spicy debates in here, and I love it because at the end of the day, I always like to say that 
but we are is the best thermostat of where the broad-based business community right. is for the state. And um, it's gone through that sieve, through that process. And so when we go to the Capitol, we cover a lot of different issues that are important. But at the end of the day, I have to represent small business, big business, in-state, out-of-state, people in, in the industries you know very well, also the industries you've never heard of. Right. We have to represent all of them. And it's complicated, but it's exciting. I love you, it. Even, you even talk about, about school, too, education. Absolutely. I, I know that YB is big on education. And, and we're going to get back to business and industry in a minute, yeah. but before I forget, like the whole education thing, you're looking to help reform the educational system, too. Well, in our minds, the same thing, business and industry and education. And the reason why is I think it's the most important issue Louisiana has to fix because, yes, it is true. Any employer needs to hire people, right? And you want to hire people, you want to make sure the school system is producing qualified workers. That is one piece of it. The other piece is every business is just a member of a community. And so you want your community to grow. You want your community to be strong. And if you don't have a solid educational system in a community, that's not only bad for business, right. but that's bad for just the community itself. Exactly. And so, um, yeah, our, our guys are focused really strongly on education reform. Um, they always have been. We will continue to be without apology. And what we're looking for is a, a innovative system that puts people and families first and that has a sole focus of giving kids the ability to read and write and stay off drugs and have good soft skills so they can leave that facility and go into either direct to the workforce with a credential, direct to a two-year program mm -hmm. to get the training they need, or direct to a four-year program and get some of the, uh, the more uh, general or, or bachelor studies they're looking for. Whatever that kid wants, we want all of them to have those options available, whether you're rich or poor, doesn't matter to us. We think that's not only good for business, but great for the state's you know, communities across uh, across Louisiana. I would love to see our vocational, uh, Vo Votech. I hate to say Votech because I was told by some, one of the groups of the Capitol, they don't like to be called Votech anymore. Um, and, and shout it's out. True. To, it's true. It's a it, term it, that has changed. It, and, yeah. and, it, but, I, but I think that having that system, I would, I would love to find, find ways to strengthen that system in our, in, our, in our state. Because I think that we're losing a lot of jobs and people in other states you know, in, in that area. And, and our no tops, people don't realize that a TOPS program also covers um, Votech. There is TOPS Tech as well. There's TOPS Tech, and people forget about that. And, and, our, and our system is improving. I don't want to be a uh, naysayer on everything. Oh, yeah, if, no. If I'm, you look yeah. at where the technical schools started, they started under Edwin Edwards. They really weren't delivering quality at that point mm -hmm. in time. They're more about patronage than, than kids. Since that time, you know, I would say that the current uh, LCTCS leader Monty, Su Monty Sullivan is a fantastic leader doing great work. His predecessor, Joe May, was also right. a, a great one. So that system is really good. I think what we need to do now is fight in the Capitol to make sure that any tripwire or red tape that right. makes it harder for that LCTCS school to work closely with that high school and put the kids first, right. that's what we got to get to. We've got good components. We just got to clear away the red tape and the tripwire and get them working on the same page. And I think those those leaders are trying their best to do that. I like how you say that because all too often, you know, uh, you know our, our high school students are said are told, you know, go get, you know, get your A's, get your A's, get your A's, because you're going to go become a, an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and they gear them towards that instead of finding out what their skills are. And because we find out that our TOPS program gets used up a lot by students who get told to go to college and become a doctor, lawyer, engineer. They go to college and they realize that they weren't cut out to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer. They end up in a VOTEC program later. And I think that we, our Louisiana loses a lot of our dollars, you know, because we lose those systems or we lose touch base with those with those children, you know, that, that if they would have been in touch with them more in high school, like you're talking yeah. about, you know, and identify where they're going to be good at and help them get started earlier to go to a program that's fit for them. And there's a fundamental difference, in my opinion, of how people like to approach a problem like that. In my opinion, and I think our organization's opinion, is the market's always going to change. You could have the best training program for welding on one side of town today. Five years from now, welding may have changed. That faculty right. may have changed. It may not be the quality there. So if you continue to deliver your funding streams based upon buildings and bureaucracies, you're always going to be a decade behind. But if we change it to where we're going to say every dollar we spend is going to be student-focused, that student is going to be the one who can control where their dollars are going to go. Then you've created a competitive marketplace. Then you're allowing the highest quality trainer in that area, whether it is a LCTCS school or a private training facility like ABC, yeah. who cares? As long as that student can bring their money wherever right. they want, that's where you're going to rise the quality across the state. And I think that's a trend we have to get to. We have baby stepped towards that as a state. 
I think in the next administration, next term, we got to take leaps towards that. I love this approach. I yeah. absolutely love how you say that. And I love how Lobby is, you know, having the foresight, foresight, you know, to be able to say, hey, let's get ahead of this curve, you know, now while we know what's coming. Right. I love that. What about um, uh, the, the students be able to take their money or, or, choose, or school choice, we'll say? Yeah. So if you go down to the K-12 level from something like that, that, that gets into there's different ways you can have choice. That's charter schools for some, that's vouchers for other. This session, you had the discussion on education savings accounts, ESAs. Mm -hmm. This is a trend that's going across the country right now. I think it's one that Louisiana has to brace sooner rather than later because it's going to become the norm at some point. We just soon be ahead of the curve. And what an ESA says is it breaks down to the way we fund a public school student today. Let's say your son is in a public school high school. The state's going to cut about $5,000 a year. The locals are going to put up about 5000 and the feds are going to sprinkle another two on top of that. So that $12,000 right. is going to go to your kid's school to educate your kid. Well, if an ESA, what it says is, if let's say your kid is special needs or wants to go in career and tech or is getting bullied or has some other challenge or is in a failing school that's not delivering, why shouldn't we tell that parent, hey, if you want to take the 5000 the state's giving you, and go to another school in your community that's better for your child, you can do it. That's what an ESA would do. It would allow parents to be able to make decisions using the same dollar today. Exactly. Those bills passed in the legislature with bipartisan votes. Hugely popular. They went up to the governor. The governor vetoed them. We think that was a tragic mistake. We think uh, that's bad policy to veto it. Uh, we're not happy. Having said that, that's what checks and balances are about. Exactly. So we'll continue to make the case. We'll try again next year, but make no mistake. Next term, if we, if we still don't have this, we will have to go to the Capitol in locked arms and stand up for the rights of parents and students because we can no longer put bureaucracies in, ahead of families. That is not the priority that people are going to tolerate anymore. And I think these reforms are not just going to deliver better quality, but it's going to make parents for the first time feel like they actually have an ability to change their kids' lives. Right. And that's what you need. You need parental involvement. There's no better way to do it than ESAs. It's funny you say that you bring this up because that's one of my questions on how people get more involved. I think identifying that lobby is more than just for business and industry that you all are looking at. For, I don't want to say cradle to grave. That sounds kind of, you know. I guess <laughs> it's fair, it, though. I it, don't sounds know. Big, it sounds almost big government <laughs> yeah, issue. Yeah, exactly. Well, but, cradle but to grave, the, the, that, we, the, what we want is people from cradle to grave to be able to have full liberty to pursue free enterprise without uh, yeah. unnecessary interference from bureaucracy or red tape. So if that's cradle to grave, that's what we are. But we, I don't want to babysit and handhold and dictate cradle to grave. I want to unleash free enterprise and allow people to go in because I think if you do that, if yeah. we get to a state where we're actually empowering people as compared to systems, I think the sky's the limit for us. Oh, I agree. Uh, we got so much to offer. We, we, we're our own worst enemy traditionally over the years, but I think that's on the verge of changing in that capital. I really do. I, I like taking terms and things that have been used in the past and showing how they can be flipped and re-innovated for the, for, for the future. So like when I say cradle to grave, you know, we talked about, you know, the Louisiana heritage, the, our culture, our family traditions and things that we have here that have you know, that we started out here from the, you know, from the cradle, yeah. you know, and now lobby is taking and during education and helping reform education in a way to prepare not only society, but those students for business and industry. And now lobby is working with business and industry to help Louisianians and take Louisiana to a future that's going to be not only better for Louisiana and its citizens, but better for future cradles. <laughs> Future cradles, so, I like that. So, 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 you know, as people approach their grave, they're going to be able to prosper in Louisiana society. A rising society. tide lifts all boats, exactly, cradles, and graves. Exactly, right. exactly, <laughs> exactly. Especially in Louisiana, That's right. That's graves. Right. Exactly. New flow sometimes. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly right. So taking all that concept, how can people in our community get more involved? I mean, like, you know, I think that more people think that lobby is just for businesses to get sure. involved in. But I really want, it sounds to me like you're working with, you know, students so parents should be involved, or student policies will say, so parents should be involved more. How can more parents get involved? How can more people get involved with the lobby at the Capitol to be able to help push this agenda like you're talking about for the ESAs, yeah. you know, for the future of Louisiana? How can people be involved in the lobby? Well, and, you know, the, the funny thing is I think a lot of those parents are involved. We do work very closely with them. That's not something that's probably commonly understood, but we do right. have that, which, which I love. That's I, what I want to promote more with yeah, this show. Yeah, that's more, great. I appreciate that. 
I think the best way to do it is, is, is first of all, get informed. We, we put a lot of information out in a lot of different ways. We've got a website like everyone else, but we also do a lot on social media. We, uh, during our legislative session, we put out a daily email every single day of the issues coming up, the issues coming up tomorrow, what happened today, how you can click here to make your voice heard. It's very easy to sign up for our email. We break it down in plain English and give you an easy way to do it. So if you're a parent, I don't like to join a group or do anything. I just want to know yeah, what's going exactly. on. Sign up to our email, and it will give you an easy, quick way to do it. That, that's one way to do it. Um, you know, the other way is you can get involved in other groups as well. It doesn't have to be lobby. We work with some of the local chambers around the state. Every community has a local chamber looking for a way to make a difference. So you work with chambers around the state, whole yeah. state. Okay. So we run a trade association uh, called Lacey that also organizes a lot of the local chambers. We don't run them, but we have a trade association that we work with with them, and so they're our partners. And so if you want to reach out to your local chamber, get involved in some of their development or policy committees, that's where it starts. It, you know, it's just like planting a crop, right? If you plant your seed in your local community, you find a way to get involved, you're going to quickly realize as a citizen how easy it is to make a difference. Oh, absolutely. If you want to roll up your sleeves and put some brain equity and some heart into something, you can make a difference quickly in Louisiana. Start there, and then if you want to move up to the state or whatever, you don't have to come talk to us to make a difference. Right. We just want... Well, we want our citizens who are not content with complacency, who love Louisiana for what mm -hmm. it is, but also have a drive to make it better than ever. And I think you can be both. Over the years, there's been this misperception that you should just love Louisiana for what right. it is, and that's good enough. No, love it for what it is, but also let's push it to be better. There's no reason we can't compete with Texas and Tennessee and Florida and North Carolina. We can kick their tail on some stuff. But we got we got to get more innovative sometimes. So get involved locally. Sign up for our emails. Get involved with us as well, whatever your comfort level is. But the more real citizens from the real world get involved, the better you'll see the policies come from that capital. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Like I said, uh, when I started my show nine years ago, I wanted to be the next right-wing conservative talk <laughs> show host. Because <laughs> my well, ideal – coming? Is it yeah. coming? <laughs> well, the, well, the show's going great, but I think it, the show's going great because I've actually changed – a, a, a little bit. So I want to be the next right-wing conservative talk show host. So I got caught up in just all of those different policies sure. and just those narratives. But then what happened was I ran for state representative three years ago. And and what I did was, since I was I was a little underfunded on, on the campaign, you know, I knocked on every single door in the district. Yeah. And, I, and, and the biggest complaint my, my friends that were in the know had for me was that I spent too much time talking to people. And I said, well, you know, by knocking on every single door... I thought my you know, district was look just like me, think just like me, live just like me. But by knocking on every door, I realized that everybody's different from me. But, you know, and this is where I think the biggest misperception out there, because I think a lot of people view politics through their Twitter feed or whatever their social media choice is. Right. Or they watch the talking head shows in D.C. and all they hear is fight, 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 right. fight, talking point, talking point. I think in the real where things happen in this capital and every capital across here, I think there's a lot more crossover than people realize. Yep, like, I like agree. Me personally, I'm a strong conservative. There's yeah. no doubt about it. But I, running an organization that has a lot of different viewpoints has really trained me as right. well. And what I've learned is so many issues everyone can correlate to, but they don't hear it because the talking point wall kind of stops I agree them. 100%. Education reform is a perfect example. When we talk about education reform, we're a conservative business group right. talking about it. But most of our allies come from not just that side, but also – from impoverished mm -hmm. liberal folks who are stuck in failing schools who say, I don't like where I'm at. I want to work with you. So we get these coalitions that I think are awesome Yeah. because we may disagree on 90% of the stuff, but the 10% we agree on, you can really move the needle on. Absolutely. And I think every issue is like that. If people are willing to put their car down, throw the talking points in a trash can for a little while, and just have a real conversation. I agree. And the more you can do that, the more we're going to realize we're not as divided as a society as we think we are. We've just been trained to see our differences as compared to what brings us together. Well, and that's and that's exactly to your point why I changed my focus. You know, after I ran for office, I knocked on every door and I listened to people. I, I met people that look different than me, or live different than me. You know, talk different. You know, everything's different. But when you talk with somebody, have those conversations like you guys, like Lobby is doing with businesses, and organizations, and parents around the state. When you talk to people, you might and you, and you even if it's someone who's very different you find out what you have in common. And if you focus on those things that you have in common, you solve problems. You, you, you ignore the ideologies, you ignore the narratives, you focus on those things that you have in common, you solve problems. 
And so that's why I rededicated my show to find those things that we unite on, even though we might be different. I have conservative values, but I've got friends who are Democrats or consider themselves liberals who in some cases are more conservative than my conservative friends claim to be. That's right. And when you, but when you talk about those issues that you relate on, you realize we can actually solve problems in our community, our state, and the best way to solve problems in our state and our communities is to work there and get rid of the narratives in D.C. The best way to fix our country is to start in our community. I think most people at the end of the day, they're not Republican or Democrat. What they are is they're, they're, they're in the kitchen table party. At the end of the day, most people, what's going on in their daily life, what's going to make their life better? And usually it's kitchen table issues. Exactly. The taxes they pay, the roads they drive on, the, the, the schools their, uh, their kids go to, that's the party they're really in. They may think that one side or the other is the answer to all their dreams. The truth is both sides are filled with wins and losses most right. likely. But at the end of the day, if you really break down the issues that matter to folks, we can get stuff done. And I think that building is starting to appreciate that. We'll see. I, I like how you can... point that way. Yeah. People don't realize Editorial that. Editorial note, the Capitol's right over <laughs> the there. Capitol's I apologize. Right. That's right. A couple blocks, a couple right. blocks out. Good point. So we'll see. I mean, I think, I think the, the best service that, you know, associations like us, um, uh, you know, radio and podcast, you know, opportunities like you have is to just break it down in real language. So your average person who has lost faith in politics, mm -hmm. lost faith in politicians, they're just driving carpool, going to work, but they still care about the state. How can they gravitate to it? Okay, it's worth putting my sweat equity into it. And I think the more we can talk about these issues in a kitchen table way, the more people will understand, okay, it's worth me staying emotionally involved, and I'm going to do it. So. A couple more short questions while yeah. we wrap up, uh, wrap up here. What unites us? I always like to ask in my podcast, you know, because I talked about, you know, I, I, my show, William Wallace for America, and I wanted yeah. to be the, you know, the next right-wing conservative talk show host, and I moved I, – I didn't move towards the middle – I, my values are still, you know, I, 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 I find that we can find things that unites us without giving up our values or our own ideologies and beliefs. You know, we can find those things that unites us. Yeah. So I like to focus on that with my shows, what unites us. So what unites us? And not only Louisiana or our country, but how does lobby work with people that with, with those things that unites us? What unites us? So I don't want to be repetitive, but I think a lot of it is, um, you know, the kitchen table issues that we all deal with on own day. But just going back to that building, I think if there's the capital, excuse me, <laughs> I think one of the biggest other problems in the capital is, is, is people are so quick to go to emotional animosity when there's a policy disagreement. I, I, I can think of so many times over the years where we can have a disagreement with a legislator or we, it, it's a tough vote. But if at the end of the day you're in the hallway – you shake their hand. You say, look, I understand where you're coming from. Uh, you hope you understand where I'm coming from. We disagree on this one. Tomorrow, that person may agree with you on another issue. And if you're going to get big things done, you can't just do it with the people who are 100% aligned mm -hmm. with you. You've got to find some crossover approach to get people who maybe could be on your side, but it's going to take a little effort. And I think too often people lose faith in, in just the, the, the things that we're taught as kids in Louisiana. Have good manners. Right. Be nice. You can be strong and conviction oriented, but still be nice. And you can be a gentleman or a gentle lady. Right. That's how we're taught here in Louisiana. So if people would bring that more, I think you'd find more ability for compromise. I just think folks are so quick to get to um, to these blood feuds mm -hmm. when it doesn't always require that. You can disagree without being disagreeable. I like how you said that. And also to your point, you know, it, you, we can agree to disagree. But at some point, I watch these votes over here at the Capitol, and sometimes it'll be, you know, they'll get all yes votes and one person will vote no, or, <laughs> or, or completely the opposite. Or you might have a Republican issue that all the Republicans vote against and all the Democrats vote for, and right. vice versa. I've seen a lot of different things, and, 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 the, and the word compromise gets to be thought of as a, as a, as a dirty process or a dirty word. When I like to tell people, you can find the middle without giving up your ideologies. You can find those things that unite us and, are, and solve problems without having to get to the bloodbath about, you know, my, my ideologies are better than yours. Yeah, and compromise has become a four-letter word for some folks because they view compromise the same thing as capitulation. So a lot of folks... I like, oh, that's, per, that's I mean, a lot. It's true, though. That's, I mean, it's, yeah. And I, I think if you're, if you're capitulating just for the sake of compromise, you're doing yourself a disservice. You're not standing on your principles. And I think if we're being honest, sometimes in the media... Compromise is defined as when will Republicans finally get closer to the Democrats. And that's not compromise either. Yeah. Both sides have to be willing to work with the other side. Exactly. And that's where a true compromise happens. And, again, I think a lot of those issues can be there, but both sides have to give a little, not just one. And um, 
you know, hopefully we can get there one day soon. Well, I believe that true compromise, and you, whether it's Republican, Democrat disagreements, when you find the fewer things that you actually can agree on, it does a great thing for the people of this country and our state. It gives us a smaller bill. You have less red tape because you're blessed that you can agree on smaller bills or yeah. less legislation. So one last question for you. What are things that, what, that lobby is working on for the future legislations or the upcoming year that either people might want to know about or people might want to get involved in? The truth and is, then how do people get involved with you guys? So the truth is the name of the game right now is trying to go around the state and convince people that we are at a historic crossroads in Louisiana. Because right now, coming out of the COVID pandemic, there's a lot of states recovering right now. And if you look at what's going on around the country, people, businesses, and families are leaving in droves from California and New York and Illinois and places like that. And they are kicking the tires on the South. They are looking at Southern states. There will be a book written one day on how the South won in this era. Tremendous amount of jobs and families. They've been South. saying the South will rise again. But Louisiana <laughs> is not one of those states right now. I, I we agree. Are, we are losing people. We're not gaining people like the other states. And so there's a tremendous opportunity. So what we're trying to tell people is next fall will be a big election cycle in Louisiana. You're guaranteed to have a new governor. There's a lot of the statewide elected officers mm-hmm. running for that, so they'll be open. Huge term limits in the legislature. There's never been a better opportunity to put in the capital an upstairs and downstairs strong team to move us into a more free and enterprise driven it. system. Yeah. And so what we're doing right now is telling folks, get ready. If you're in the business community, you're about to get a knock on your door. Some candidate this. for office is going to knock and they're going to say, hey, can you support me? If you just say, hey, yeah, I've known you forever. I'll support you. That's a loss. You have to tell them, where are you on tax reform? Where are you on education reform? Tell me your policies on that. If you push them to be specific, they will be. They want to say what you need to hear. So push them on that. Last thing I'd say at Lobby we're doing is we're running boot camps all around the state, and we're trying to encourage business owners to run for office. Yeah. There's no reason a business owner shouldn't run for office, and so we're doing these boot camps to where we teach them how to set up a website, how to set up a campaign, how to raise money, because if we can get more people from the real world who know what it's like to run a business, know what it's like to deal with customer demand, mm-hmm. inflation, supply chains, all those things, you put those people in office – they're going to view government a whole lot differently exactly. than career government people do. So we are excited about the next year and a half. But if we, the citizens of the state, do not demand better next fall, we're just going to get more of the same. And that would be a huge missed opportunity for all of us. I like, I like your approach. And, and one last comment on that, you know, is when businessmen not only did make, make government more practical and more business-oriented and more fiscally responsible, but that also uh, figures out how to do things with less people. Less people means less bureaucracy right. when it comes to government, and we have to we, and we have to remember that it's not just the elected officials that are making poor decisions. Sometimes that sometimes these these multiple layers of bureaucracy that they create create more of a quagmire for True. business in general. That's right. And business and do, don't do that. That's well, right. any final words on uh, how people can get in touch with you guys? Or well, th- I mean, thank you for for the opportunity to visit with you. And if you want to go more, uh, labi.org. LABI.org is the best way to go to our to our website and check it out. Um, and then social media, we're on everything from Instagram to LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and all kind of good stuff. So check us out on there and let us know how we can help you. Stephen Wagusback, Louisiana Business Industry. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Everybody else, please share the video, share the interview. And as always, you can find this podcast on all podcast apps, wherever you like to listen to your favorite podcast. Thank you so much and have a great day.